Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second week of Fastbook uh, Reading Group. Um, it's so to say, so say a session starting shortly, but um, let's begin. Um, so something, so the, the whole week, the whole first week has been really, really exciting, um, and it's been much more exciting than I imagined. Um, and as part of week one, uh, we covered until topic 1.6.7 of the chapter one uh, of Fastbook. And what we're planning to do for this week or for today is going to be, we're going to do um, chapter two and we're going to do wrap up uh, chapter one as well. Um, and we'll do half of chapter two. Um, and I, something as I have promised in the past is we're gonna have Sayyam, Zach, uh, Tanish doing guest lectures. Um, Sayyam just sent a hello in, in chat. So hey, Sayyam, and um, Tanish is here today. He's with us and he'll be, uh, he'll be uh, presenting, he'll be presenting um, about his journey on Fast AI. Hey, Tanish, um, do you hello. wanna quickly uh, tell everyone about uh, how you're related to Fast AI and um, what you're gonna be talking about today towards the end? Yes, um, so yeah. Um... I was uh, also, uh, I guess, an alumnus of the FastAI course. Um, I took the FastAI course back in 2019, and uh, it, you know, really helped me with my deep learning journey. And I've also been a frequent contrib contributor to the uh, FastAI forums and to the FastAI library. And uh, I've been using FastAI in my own research as well. Excellent. And um, today, uh, you'll be discussing about how your journey started with FastAI and um, how'd you end up uh, being, a, being a solid contributor to the FastAI world and being someone who's very well known in the, in the ML community. So really appreciate your time and uh, thanks for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Um, and then, well, just to, we're going to spend a quick five minutes recap of the first week. The first week has been uh, super exciting. We've had uh, I, I believe that that person's Korean. Uh, uh, he's he's um, he's he started a new blog, um, and he's keeping a. I mean, it's really exciting to see that people are uh, keeping and taking the advice that we shared in last week, and this has come out of. Um, and he started his own new blog. Uh, we've seen Ravi on Twitter. He's he's had a whole summary of of how the first talk looked like, uh, which is really exciting to see, and he's he's added all the important links and notes uh, from the week one. Uh, we've had Abhi, he's, he's, he's also had, he's also provided a summary of what we covered in week one. Um, and Abhishek uh, has also done that. So I think it's really exciting to see that um, you guys are really enjoying uh, being here and it, it's really exciting and it's really motivating for me to, um, to continue doing this with, with even more. Um, but what's more exciting is that we've had about 200 members on Slack um, already, and uh, we're all doing this together. So this is the same motto as last time is we're gonna all do this together and we're gonna make sure that each one of us finish. Um, and we've had activity on the forum. So we've had, and all of the questions that we've asked this week, we have answered. Um, so we've had, as I've mentioned, we've had 213 members um, on Slack. And what's really exciting is to see people like Sam come up and Sam said um, he's going to help with any setup questions and um, it's literally the community coming together and this is the benefit of doing um, doing Fastbook as a group uh, rather than doing it alone because then people like Sam come up uh, we have Karthik who was asking a question but Kevin was already there um, to answer that question for him Brad was there um, Sam was there again and that uh, believe that question got solved. So I've always been late to all of the questions that I've tried to answer. Um, we've had another question like, okay, I've got an issue on, uh, I've got an issue uh, using Google Colab and does anybody uh, know how to solve it? So Ramin was there, Sam was there and, and Brad was there again. And they've all answered the questions uh, even before I got a chance to do so. Um, I've seen Sai and I'm really excited to see that Sai has said, uh, I'm going to commit to completing it properly this time. So he's committed to uh, being there for 20 weeks. And this is just 10, 15% of the activity that we've, we've seen uh, on, on Slack and on the forums. And we've seen um, this is a really interesting uh, fast AI docs material being shared uh, on Slack as well. So it's really, really exciting to see uh, lots of shares, lots of uh, activity going on, and lots of resources that are that are being shared. And 
um, again, there was this question about, uh, I'm having a problem when I'm trying to download images. Uh, somebody already pointed to the Fast AI forum. So if you haven't looked at what the Fast AI forums are, um, they're a gold mine of uh, pretty much all your Fast AI related questions. So if I go to that point and I go to forums.fast.ai, um, and I mentioned the Fast AI forums last time as well, but this is really where uh, you can start and you can ask all your questions that are related to Fast AI. Um, and we've also seen Richard be there and he was he was asking a question. And again, um, Justin was there to the rescue and he answered that question by giving a link to the Fast AI forum. So that's how exciting uh, this first week has been. Um, something I was really sad about last week was we couldn't cover much ground. And um, in 60 minutes, we were only able to cover half of uh, the first chapter. So something we're doing, um, you would have seen this announcements, but I just want to quickly uh, mention them again, that we're going from 60 minutes to 90 minutes instead. Um, the whole idea is we want to cover more ground uh, and we want to make sure that that everybody is, is following along. Um, something that just happened uh, last week was an informal get to know you catch up. Uh, it should it should be get to know us as in, uh, it was really exciting to talk to people who are doing Facebook. It was really exciting to hear feedback that you guys had for me. Uh, it was really exciting to understand which backgrounds you come from. We've seen uh, bachelor students, we had uh, working professionals. So it was really exciting to talk to you guys. And uh, we do plan on doing this again uh, today. Uh, so the link for uh, Slack is, uh, Angelica has just mentioned on the Zoom chat, it's oneDB.me slash Slack. Uh, that's where in the Facebook channel, we'll be sharing a link today again for uh, Zoom catch up. So please feel free to come in and say hi and we can talk to each other. Um, the recordings, you already know where they're going. Um, and by this time, I hope uh, everybody is set up and everybody has got their GPUs running because things are going to get much more interesting uh, from here on and they're going to get much more uh, let's just say the level is going to increase as we go week by week. Okay, uh, with that being said, we are ready to begin. Uh, something I've done from last week to this week is I've went in, I've converted the whole Jupyter Notebook to a PDF, so it's easier for me. I really like uh, doing things like taking the pen in my hand and I really like scribbling. Um, it, it's really easy for me to then explain things and Jupyter, uh, I couldn't find a better way to do it than just convert it to a PDF. Um, so let's just let's just quickly go through what we uh, discussed last week. Um, we saw deep learning is for everyone. That was the first thing and the main thing that we saw is that anybody from any background uh, can come and do deep learning. Uh, you guys can see my one note, right? Just, just double checking. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Anand. Uh, cool. So then we saw um, there was a brief history of neural networks uh, that we looked at. Uh, we looked at who Jeremy is, what background he comes from. We looked at who Sylvain is. Uh, so we, Jeremy and Sylvain are both, uh, uh, who've, they've both contributed a lot of their time in open source world and um, thanks to them, we have this book that we're discussing today. Um, we looked at the basic idea of how to learn deep learning. Um, and the basic idea of learning deep learning is um, to do it like a, a baby learns football. Um, it's like a game. You're given the football first and you start playing with it first. And we want to have lots of experimentation. We want to play with deep learning. And that's the main idea of how we're going to learn deep learning. We're going to do lots of projects. We're going to form uh, we're going to basically do lots of projects. We're going to uh, learn by playing um, deep learning. We had a look at uh, the projects and mindset. So the so the project is is something that you complete that you you're really proud of. It's not something that we really want you to commit to the projects. Uh, we really want you to uh, find something that interests you because if there's something that interests you, then that's something you'll definitely end up finishing. Um, we looked at what PyTorch, FastAI and Jupyter are. So uh, FastAI is built on top of PyTorch um, and past, uh, PyTorch is the underlying uh, low level library. And that's where we started. We started with the first model. Um, so we looked at uh, getting, we need, we need GPU. Uh, we need a GPU to be able to run all of the code uh, that's present in Fastbook. And one of the main uh, pointers where I said we should get started is Google Colab. Because um, it's just the easiest way to get started. All you need is a, a Google account and you can just click on any chapter and that will open up in a Colab notebook. Uh, there's more, more options uh, that are also mentioned on the book's website. 
And then we started running our first notebook, which was going to be a classification of dogs versus cats. Uh, and we used that to train our, we, we train our first model, basically. Um, so the data set was called Oxford uh, IT Pet Dataset. Uh, and these are the lines of code that we ran. Um, there were questions that were being asked on what uh, each line does uh, in, in this part of code. And there were some technical questions and some errors. But we almost just with, this is how exciting and this is how wonderful fast AI is, that in just six lines of code, uh, we're able to actually first download the data set, then create a model, a deep learning model that can classify uh, dogs from cats. And we almost get 100% accuracy or 0.004% error. So that's really, really high. And that's really, really good um, in just a very short amount of code. So that's why fast AI is one of the best places to start if you're starting out with deep learning, because it takes away a lot of boilerplate code. You don't have to actually uh, worry about what's going on underneath, and you can use all these convenience functions from fast AI. Uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, all of what's happening in this um, in this uh, piece of code. Um, the next thing we did was we can actually test the models on our own images. So it's it's possible that uh, if, you, if you've already run this in a Google Colab, you could have gone in and you could have uploaded your own cat or dog picture. Um, and it actually does apply that the probability of a cat is 1%. So that's the first, uh, that's the first classifier we started within just 30 or 40 minutes of starting out. Um, next, we looked at what traditional programming looks like. So if you have your inputs, um, you, you pass them through a program and you just get results. That's just traditional programming. Um, how deep learning is different. Um, in deep learning, you have a model that has inputs and it has weights. But in the same way, um, these model, these weights are assigned to the model. And in the same way, you pass the inputs and you get the results. But the way it's different is that what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're able to update these weights. And we discussed this a little bit, that this is something that's called backpropagation, but we'll learn more about this. Um, but in a way, you have your inputs, your weights go into the model, you get some results. Uh, you check how your model's performance is. Is the model performing better or worse? And then you keep updating your weights because the weights are what are assigned to model. So you keep updating your weights. You keep doing this cycle over and over again till your model has really good weights uh, and, and the performance is really uh, something that's acceptable in high. Um, so in a way, when you get, when you get a trained model, uh, then all you can do is that trained model can have those weights uh, that you learned from here. Um, those weights can then just be here assigned to this model. And in the same way, it's just like general programming. You pass your inputs and you get your results. So that's just how a trained model looks like. Cool. Um, then we, this is where we're going to start uh, today is we're going to have a look at some of the jargon. Um, so a weight, I, a model in deep learning world today, um, a model can also be called an architecture. So the functional form of the model, um, there's, no, there's no point in digging very deep into these things, but let's just say you'll hear uh, model architectures together as words that would refer to this thing that's being trained to this function that's being trained that can actually make predictions. Um, you'll hear weights and parameters almost uh, together. So somebody will call these things as weights. Um, somebody will call them as parameters. Uh, you'll hear the word loss a lot. Uh, labels are the actual true labels of the data set, which we'll also have a look into um, as we go down uh, more into the notebook. Um, and the loss is something that depends on these predictions from the model and it depends on the labels. So in a way, if you put that jargon into that whole image, uh, you get this. Um, your inputs and instead of uh, weights, you call them parameters. They go into the model instead of the model, you call it architecture. Uh, you get your predictions, you calculate your loss. Loss is just performance. Um, loss also requires the true labels and then you just update your weights. Um, so this is, just the, this is just the main idea of deep learning. And this is something not even deep learning is something that's very traditional um, and these concepts can be applied to to all uh, all of machine learning today. Cool. Um, so from here on, uh, this is where things are going to be new and uh, I'm going to slow my pace and um, in case you thought I was going too fast. Um, so uh, what are the limitations uh, to machine learning? Uh, one of the limitations of machine learning is you can't really do anything without data. Data is key uh, and a lot of the things and how your model is trained would, would depend on the kind of data that you have. So the model will only learn the patterns that it will see in the input data. Um, and the model basically creates predictions 
based on the patterns it has learned from the input data, and it doesn't really do recommended actions. So I will, I'm skipping through. Uh, I'm skipping through the chunks that I believe. I'm just going. I'm going to go through the main ideas of the notebook. Uh, so when you go back and you can read through them, and if there's still any questions, you can ask us. Um, but the main things I want to touch upon are how does that piece of code or what's in those uh, six lines of code and provide you with some transparency. Uh, so the first line of code we saw was just from fastai.vision.all import star. Um, that's just importing all your modules and all your libraries and all your function. Um, so untar data is a function in Python, uh, and this is what's importing that that function called untar data. Um, one of the things is uh, generally in that's generally frowned upon in in Python world, like lots of people who um, would say, "Oh, we're professional software developers," or um, we want to write code in, in a certain way, in a certain design, they will say uh, importing star is bad practice. Uh, but actually, Jeremy says that in a Jupyter notebook where we want to do lots of experiments, it's actually pretty handy to have lots of uh, functions ready so you can just call them directly. Uh, so the next thing that this does is um, you'll be surprised at how much just this line of code is doing. Uh, it's actually url.pets is a, is a URL. Uh, so it's something uh, that's the pets URL. That's where the data set is based in the internet. Um, what this untar data function is going to do, it's going to download that from the internet to your local computer. Then uh, it's basically going to unzip it. So you're going to have all the images and all your uh, labels as files. And then in there, there's two folders. One is the images and the second one is uh, annotations. Uh, all this does is then it returns a path to the to the images folder of of that data set. Um, then we saw we defined a function which looked like this. Uh, this is just so um, sorry, something I should quickly mention is what are labels and what are predictions. I would believe that um, so if you have when you have a data set, so let's say I have uh, 1 million images, then for each image, I have a category. So if this is my first image, then for this category, I could say it's cat, uh, cat, dog, cat, dog, cat. Um, these categories are called labels. And when you make predictions on this data set, uh, basically from your trained model, uh, they're the predictions. So that's the difference in, in labels and predictions. Predictions are what the model uh, is actually predicting. Um, and labels are the true labels, the true categories of, of all the images that are there in your data set. So as many uh, images you have, you'll have the same number of labels. Uh, so what this uh, is cat function is doing, uh, because we were creating a dogs versus cat classifier. Um, so what you need is in your data set, if you have a data set again, as I mentioned, you have this data set of uh, say 7,000 images, then what you need for each uh, data set of each image is a label. You need to say that, is this a cat? Yes or no. Uh, is this a cat? Yes or no. So if it's, if it's a no, it's basically a dog. It's just a way of saying yes, cat, no cat, um, yes, no. So that this becomes your labels, right? Um, and this is what the model will use to learn. Um, and one way to just convert, like one way to get these labels is just using this function. So this function is just a way to create labels. Cool. Uh, majority of things happen in this uh, line of code. Uh, it's something that is starts with called something called image data loaders. Uh, when you're doing, you'll see in FastAI, it's really convenient. And uh, you will see that when you start with FastAI, if you're working on images, you'll, you'll start with the word image, image data loaders. When you're working with text, it will be called text data loaders. Um, and then a lot of things, uh, get passed to this function, you get passed a path, uh, uh, this get image files uh, function as well, and then a valid percentage. So let's, we'll, we'll go now and just have a look at what each of these mean. Um, so the first thing we passed is this label func equals cat. That's just, as I've already mentioned, is cat is just a way of telling whether the thing is a cat or a dog. Um, so this label function is just used to label your data set, because otherwise all you have is your data set and you don't have any labels, but you need labels to learn the model. 
for the model to learn. Um, the next thing you will see is we're passing something called item transforms equals resize two to four. Um, in fast AI, you basically have two types of two types of transforms. You have something called an item transform, and you have something called a batch transform. Um, so what what's the difference? Like what is a batch and what is an item? So let's say I have my data set uh, of 1,000 images. So these are all from one to 1,000. So this is my first image. Uh, this is my 1,000 image. Then the item transforms are what gets applied to each of these images. So if I apply to each of these images um, what these items are, they are actually different from, from the first items because they have been transformed. Um, and specifically what the resize two to four is doing, uh, if my input images were of different sizes, so say they were 256 by 256 pixels, or they were say 512 by 512, um, then applying a resize transform on each of the items is going to make sure that my transformed data set is of two to four by two to four size. So that's the first thing. That's what these item transforms are. And, and they get applied to pretty much every item in your data set. The next thing that you do is you have these thousand transformed items. So I'm just gonna call it transformed items here. Um, so you have these thousand transformed items. Um, the next thing that you do is you start grouping them in batches of 10. So my first group has 10 images, my second group has 10 and my last group has 10. So if you have, thousand items and each group has 10, you're going to end up with 100 batches. Um, and I'm just telling you what exactly happens in deep learning. Like this is the exact process of how you go from having a data set to then uh, training a model. Um, the next thing that happens is then you pass each of these batches one by one to a GPU. Uh, and this is where the model will actually start training. A GPU is a, a graphic processing unit. It's very similar to a CPU, uh, but much faster, much more performant. Um, and this, this process of once each of the data sets, so you can see how each batch contains different images. Um, once all of the images or all of the apogee, all of the batches have been passed to this GPU once, it's called one epoch. And this process of the model actually learning is called model fitting. I'll take two quick questions if anybody has two quick questions um, on, on what we've learned so far. Uh, and we're gonna take questions on one db dot me slash passbook two. Okay. Uh, so there's no specific questions related to item transforms, or um, that's fine. I did. I did see a quick question. Can you can you explain about what an epoch is again? Uh, that's okay. If you don't understand what what epoch is, it is fine. But it's basically just when your model has seen all of your data set. Uh, once it's called one epoch, when it has seen all of your data set twice, it's called two epochs. So basically when you do a full pass of your whole data set to your GPU, uh, or sorry, to your model, that's just called an epoch. Excellent. Um, so then this is just information about the data set in the book. And this is when you, you'll read, you'll see this, that it has, it, it's the PETS data set. It has 7,400 pictures um, and the, and the, uh, picture names are something like this, Great Pyrenees 173.jpg, which just means that it's the 173rd image of the Great Pyrenees breed dog in the data set. Um, this is important. So this is our data set information that we use to label our data set. Uh, the file names start with an uppercase letter if the image is cat uh, and a lowercase if the image is dog. So if the image if the image name starts with a capital letter, it's a cat. And if it starts with a lower letter, it's a dog. So that's why, if you can see, we had something like this. 
is upper is upper basically is just a python function that says is the first letter capital or is the first letter small um so in that way you can actually classify just based on uh the image uh just based on the uh file names you can classify them as cats and dogs this brings us then to the most important part of this whole uh, exercise, which uh, one of the key parameters that we passed was this one here, valid percentage equals 0.2. Um, so what is this valid percentage equals 0.2? Um, this is something that's really, really important. And I have, do have a small image to explain this. Um, I told you that when you have your items, so this is my first item, and let's say this is my thousandth item, um, then what you do is if your valid percentage is 0.2, that just means you split your data set, 80% of it becomes your training set, and 20% of it becomes your validation set. Um, what's the difference in the training and the validation set? This is something that's really, really important. Um, the model, the model learns from the training set and the model is tested on the validation set. What this means is the training set is what the model is actually seeing. Um, when I say, what does it mean that the model is actually seeing? It just means that there's gonna be 800 images. If, if the cats and dogs had a uh, thousand images, then these 800 images are what the model sees. And these 800 images are what the model learns from. Um, but then you have your 200 images of cats and dogs again. Um, so then what you do is you make the model learn from the training set. And then you take these 200 images and you predict the, you make the model say, okay, here are 200 new images that you haven't seen so far. Can you make predictions? Can you say if all of these 200 images are cats or dogs? So from 200 images, it will say, okay, 150 of these are cats and these 50 are dogs. But then based on those predictions, you can actually, uh, you can actually check how accurate your model is. You can actually check the performance of the model. So we always wanna check the performance of the model on a validation set. It's also called a holdout set because you pretty much uh, held out 20% of the data set straight away. Um, so that's the key difference. And I'm just gonna quickly touch upon something which is called overfitting. Um, so you might ask, okay, why do we need a validation set? Like what's the purpose of it? Um, so the basic and the most easy example is this one. Um, so let's say you have a list of points on your 2D graph, right? Uh, if you don't have a validation set or basically fitting is a way of checking, like if the model, um, if the model just picks the patterns of each of these points like this. Because um, imagine in real world, what you're gonna do is you have a trained model. Um, so your model is going to be trained and then you're gonna take it up in a real world. You're gonna take it up and you're gonna ask it to make predictions on, to make predictions on other data, right? That's the, that's how, things are gonna be in the real world. So say if you're a medical company, what you're gonna do is you're gonna give the model say 1 million X-ray images. And then in the real world, when this model, this X-ray model that can tell um, if there's something in an X-ray or not, when it, it, it gets applied or it gets used in a hospital, then the X-ray images that it's gonna see are gonna be completely new. So what we want is that we want the model to learn the patterns, we want the model to learn these patterns and we want the model to learn, uh, we want the model to learn the general patterns from, from this training set, but we don't want it to memorize the training set. By memorize the training set is, I just mean that if it's, if it, if you give the model the same images 10,000 times, then it's not going to be able to do a good job on making a prediction on a different image. So that's the difference um, we need the model to generalize. And when a model that looks like this, when it has, when it has pretty much memorized your data set. So this is called memorizing the data set. 
I'm, I'm just going to say memory. Um, but this is where the, the model has memorized the data set. And this is what a proper fit looks like because it's just learned the general patterns. Um, so that's just a difference of uh, using a proper fit and a, and a overfitting. Um, finally, uh, what we did, and we will have questions after, I'll, I'll give some time for quick questions after this. Um, finally, what we did, this is the fifth line of the code uh, that we saw in those six lines. Uh, we created something called a CNN learner. Uh, so what's a CNN learner? A CNN learner is a convolutional neural network. Um, in this book, it says the convolutional neural networks are state of art today, um, but this book was written in 2020. What's happening in 2021 is that there's new architectures, there's new models that are catching up to convolutional neural networks. But for your understanding, convolutional neural network is just a way, it's just a, so you know how we had a model that we defined like a black box. Um, a CNN or a convolutional neural network is just a type of model that can actually learn things from your data set. So it can be used, it's widely used in images. It's widely used. Um, it's also sometimes used in text, but widely and everywhere in uh, image classification or image related tasks, you will see a CNN um, being applied. Um, so the next thing we did was we picked something called a ResNet 34. It's just a particular type of a convolutional neural network. Um, so what ResNet is, ResNet is just a type of a model architecture. And the number 34 in ResNet 34 tells you that that's how many layers there are in this uh, model architecture. It's completely okay if you don't know what ResNet is, if you don't understand what convolutional neural network is. As we go into the next chapters week by week, everything will make uh, sense. And in fact, by the, I think it's the 18th or the 19th week, we will create the ResNet architecture from scratch. So basically we will know exactly then the nuts and bolts of what ResNet is. But because you're seeing this the first time, you, um, you, you're hearing the word ResNet the first time, it's just an architecture that works for image classification. It's just a mathematical function that can predict or classify cats from dogs very easily. Um, so the number 34 is just the number of layers or how big this network is. Um, it, it basically means that ResNet 18 is smaller than ResNet 34, and then ResNet 152 is one of the biggest uh, networks. Um, so last thing then, what is a metric? Uh, so the metric is just a way of checking how good my model is, is doing, like how the performance is. Um, but something I really want to... I uh, really want to highlight here is a difference in a loss and a metric. Um, so the difference in a loss and a metric is this. A loss is what your model uses to train, basically. Um, so because we know we were doing backpropagation or we were doing SGD, um, so loss is something that this stochastic gradient descent or just this process, um, I'll go back to this, uh, image at the top. Okay. Um, so you have your model architecture, which has some parameters. This is how it looks like. You get some inputs. This architecture makes some predictions. Then you calculate the loss based on these predictions. So I think by now you should already know what predictions and labels are. So based on these predictions and labels, it calculates the loss and it updates the parameters again. Um, what this loss does, um, this loss is easy for, so SGD is what does the actual update. I'm just gonna call it stochastic gradient descent. Um, SGD is what is used to update the parameters. And loss is something that's really helpful for the SGD to know how I need to update the parameters. But then what's a metric? So what's a metric? So when you have a trained model or while you're training your model, when it looks like this, you have your inputs, you have your model and you have your result. Um, then on the data set, let's just call this data set, you have your thousand images and you have your thousand labels, um, then it's gonna have thousand predictions. 
So between the labels and the predictions, you can actually check the accuracy of how accurate my model is. And that accuracy is a metric. It's, in, it's not being used by the model to actually do the learning, but it's good for us as humans when we're training these deep learning models. It's good for us to know, okay, um, I know that my model by the fifth epoch has 50% accuracy in, in classifying cats versus dogs. And I know that the model by the 10th epoch has 100% accuracy or something like 95% accuracy. But that's just a number that's good for us for reporting purposes. It's not helping the model train at all. What's actually helping the model train is the loss function that tells the model how to update the weights. And that loss function is uh, in general, in, in a in a image classification, is a cross entropy loss. Um, so that's a key difference. It's okay if you don't get the most of it, but as long as you get a general idea of the difference between a loss and a metric, uh, that's good for me. Um, and this is the last thing that I'll touch upon before we open the thing for um, before I open it um, before I let you guys ask questions that you might have so far. Um, but something that you do. Uh, you would have, if you've read the book so far, um, something that you would have seen is or heard in the wild is something called a pre-trained model. Um, so what is a pre-trained model? If I'm going with a ResNet 34, it would have 34 layers. Then I basically have one massive data set. Let's just call it 1 million images. Um, this massive data set is called ImageNet. So what the model does is it actually first learns from this, this ImageNet data set. And we will see how this is important and why this is important. Um, but the model basically learns from these 1 million images first. So this is what a trained model looks like it has some weights um, and it's learned on these 1 million images called ImageNet. Then something that we do is we remove the final layer. So this thing is gone and we replace it with something called a head. So it's just a new head. Because when you're working on your cats versus dogs, um, ImageNet has 1000 categories. By 1000 categories, I mean, uh, some images are that of a fish, some images are that of a human, um, some images like could be a dog, could be a piano, uh, could be like all of these different thousand categories. Uh, but because what we wanna do now is instead of predicting on the thousand categories, we just wanna predict on two categories. We just update this final layer to do this, but we keep the same weights from the image net to here. So this part of the architecture is actually the same as before. Um, and this process of first training a model on a general really large data set like ImageNet and then fine tuning it or then basically training it on your small data set that you care about is called fine tuning. And it's specifically called as using the pre-trained weights. So these pre, it's basically before you do the actual training of the cats versus dogs, you're doing a pre-training. So just before you're doing a pre-training on ImageNet. Um, and this is called as using the pre-trained weights. When you use the same weights for the new model, it's just called using as a pre-trained weights. So that's what, um, that's what you will see is called a pre-trained model. And then what is this process called fine tuning? Just this process of like not actually training any of this, like we're not actually updating this part of the model, we're just using the same weights, but we actually train just this new part of the model. Um, this is what is called as fine tuning. When you keep the stem or you keep the uh, bulk of the model as the same. All right, that's it. Um, that's the whole piece of code, and uh, that's exactly what uh, that's exactly how those six lines of code work, and that's all the uh, deep learning jargon that you need to know right now. So uh, let's spend five minutes on on questions uh, that are related specifically to these things, and I'll spend five minutes on trying to answer them.
Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so the question is, it seems like fine tuning trains the whole part of the network, um, but I've also heard as this words of freezing layers or these things, um, what's the difference? Uh, so what fine tuning in, in, in uh, fast AI does is it does two passes, one and two. In the first pass, it takes this model where just the head is new. So just this head is new. It takes this model as is, and it trains just the head, trains. It does not train, does not train. Um, so this is the head, this is the stem. Um, it does not train the stem, it trains the head. Uh, so this is the first pass when you call fine tuning. This is just the first pass of what happens in, fine, uh, in, in fast AI. And this process of not training the earlier layers of your model is called as freezing the earlier layers. But you're actually training the head. Okay, so that's the first pass. Um, in the second pass, then what happens is now you're, you have, I'm gonna call it a trained head. So I'm just gonna call, cause the stem is as it is, but your head is trained. Um, the next thing that you do is you actually train both of them. So I'm just going to call it train yes um, and train yes to both of them. But you train this side of the head a little bit faster than the stem. And we'll see why that, that is. But this is how uh, fine tuning works um, in, in fast AI. So that's the question. So I hope that answers. It seems like in fine tuning used for cats versus in chapter one retrains all the layers. Yes, it's the second part of fine tuning that does this. But I've also heard the idea of freezing some layers. So now you know what freezing is. And uh, I wasn't able to find parameters that does so. Um, it's just fine tune. Uh, so what does learn, what does the one signifies in learn dot fine tune? It just means that you have one epoch. So you do this, you do this once, and you also do this once, but it's actually like two separate things that you do once. But if, if your epochs was, epoch number was say five, then you repeat this step five times. Repeat this step, um, but not like this one is only the, in the first one. So this doesn't get carried on to the next ones, but you're training your model five times. Um, and, and the reason why you need to have like higher number of epochs is because the model in just, one epoch can't really understand uh, what exactly your patterns in your in your uh, data set are. Uh, that's been answered. This has been answered. All right. Um, so that's the that's the basics that we need to know about uh, in fine tuning and. Uh, that's the basics that we need to know about what pre-training is and how this works. Um, so the next thing that we need to touch upon is this idea of what the model actually learns. Um, so I told you that a model has looks like this. Like this is the final layer, it's called the head. Um, ResNet 34 has something like 34 layers, which you can say break into groups or let's just say, I mean, it's still 34 layers, but for simplicity, for simplicity, let me say I'm having a very small model. Instead of 34 layers, I just have like six layers. Let's say I have six layers. So this is first, two, three, four, five, and then six. Um, what's really interesting is that a deep learning model, each layer learns different things about your data set. Um, so the first layer, this is my first layer. Uh, the first layer is actually just learning how to tell edges. It's actually just learning like, okay, this is how a diagonal looks like. This is how a diagonal looks like. Um, it's just learning how to tell edges. It's just learning how to tell diagonals. That's just the first layer. But the second layer builds on top and it starts to learn patterns like circles. It starts to learn patterns like these. Uh, kind of like top left edges because it's now building on top of what the first layer learns. So the first layer already knows about these edges. It already knows about these things. And the second layer builds on top 
Uh, and based on that, based on these patterns, it can actually learn things like, so for example, based on this pattern, um, you can see how it's able to tell sort of like windows. Um, so, the, so by the second layer, um, by the second layer, the model is able to tell like all these small different objects of like patterns. It's able to tell this pattern. So it's learning some patterns that are built on top of uh, what it learned in the first layer. Um, then it combines these patterns in the third layer. And you can see how by now, by this time, it's, it's not only able to tell circles, but it's also able to tell circles and like edges together. So it's, it's combined them. Um, it's, it's able to tell more complex patterns like in like over here. Um, it's it's starting to tell uh, human faces. It's it's starting to learn things about like bees. It's starting to learn things about what fur are in in my cats and dogs. So it's it's basically um, slowly and steadily the model by the third layer is is learning more than what it has in the first and the second layer. Uh, by the fourth layer again, it's it's learning more complex patterns and like proper images of dogs, uh, proper images of 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 basically birds or um, animals, it, it's learning proper images of, so not only now does it know spheres and uh, edges, it now can tell cameras. Um, and by the last layer, it can actually do the task that you that you want it to do. Um, so this was the Zeiler and Fergus paper that uh, kind of uh, visualized uh, how these different parts of the model learn. Um, and something I wanna stress upon is, you know, when I said pre-trained weights, so when I said pre-trained weights, what we actually do is we remove the last layer, right? Um, so the last layer, if it was trained on ImageNet or like 1 million images, this last layer is what is learning all the patterns, right? But what I want to do is now, instead of doing this, I want to learn uh, cats and dogs. But for learning cats and dogs, things like learning about what fur are or things like learning what edges are, are still gonna be important, right? Um, so these weights or these things that the model has learned in the earlier layers is still important. So this is still important. Um, and you're not starting you're not starting from scratch when you when you're training on your cats and dogs. Um, by now, your model already knows things like, okay, what are edges, what are spheres, what are what are common patterns? Um, and that really improves the training and it really helps uh, the model have significant performance. Like without pre-training, without th this process is called reusing weights and it's called pre-training. Um, without pre-training, it's really, really difficult uh, for the models to converge and it takes much longer. It takes lots of more compute. Um, so this, this is really the key idea in computer vision is that if you can reuse the weights, um, this is, going to help. Um, and then you can see how it's like, you don't really, the last thing I'll touch upon in this chapter is that you don't really need to train like the first part, which can just learn these edges. You don't really need to retrain the model, right? So if you can keep these weights as is, but make the model learn the later edges of the part faster, um, then that's that's just going to help your model in general because we don't really want the model to uh, now reset um, if the learning rate in the in the early bits of the uh, early bits of the model is, is really high. Um, I mentioned learning rate. I shouldn't have said learning rate, but you'll see what learning rate is uh, uh, in the coming weeks. Um, so then, this is the last part of the whole uh, chapter: is that you can't really. It's not just like deep learning is not just for. Uh, image classification, but you can do things like spectrogram class classification, a uh, time series. Uh, this was one where uh, it was used for fraud detection. So you can actually convert all these different domains to images, and then you can train an image classifier on top uh, that can actually do the classification. Um, so it's it's so I guess the idea is that image re image recognizers can handle uh, non-image tasks. Because if you can convert like music spectrograms, so if you have a spectrogram and you can plot it on an image and then you train an image classifier on top, then you're actually able to tell spectrograms. So you're able to uh, separate these uh, audios. Like you can tell how gunshot is different from in uh, engine or uh, uh, basically from street music. Um, but in essence, you still, you don't have to learn anything new 
if you know how to do image classification. So this is something I really want you to think about. If you're in a domain, if you're in an industry where um, you can convert your data set to images, uh, then trust me, training an image classifier on top will really give you good results. So have a, have a try it. Like if you're in a time series, then try plotting that time series as, as, uh, um, as this person did. And it's something called a Gramian angular difference field. I have no idea what that is because I'm not from the domain, but apparently you can plot time series as images. And then if you train your models on uh, if you train your models on these on these different images, then it's it's really helpful and can actually tell different time series patterns. Um, and then the last part of this whole chapter. Uh, so so the question then also is how is deep learning different from machine learning? Uh, every concept that we've learned so far is applicable to machine learning as well. Uh, but what makes deep learning distinctive is that it is just a particular type of architectures. So these ResNets, these uh, ResNet 34, ResNet 50, these are just particular architectures that, uh, that are common to, to deep learning and are different from machine learning. But in machine learning, you have things like XGBoost, uh, Random Forest and others. Um, finally, the um, I'm going to skip through this part quickly because it's it's very um, very much okay if you just go back and uh, read through it. Uh, but this is just an introduction that deep learning is not just for image classification because so far we've only seen examples of image classification. Uh, but you can do things like uh, in a in an image you can actually tell like okay these are the exact pixels of the road. Uh, these are the exact pixels of a footpath. These are the exact pixels on the left of buildings. These are the exact pixels of of sky and and so on. So you can actually tell pixel by pixel in an image, uh, which is really helpful in, in autonomous vehicles. Um, so that's, uh, that's called the image segmentation. Uh, you can also tell sentiment reviews or movie reviews, which is the most common example. So if you say, if you, if you give the deep learning model something like, I really like that movie, uh, it can tell you if the review is positive or not. Um, and, and then, in Python, uh, on uh, basically when you're using fast AI, if there's any function that you have a question about, uh, something that you can actually do is you just uh, write the word doc before that actual function, and it will open up something like this, which will actually tell you what it does. Uh, you can click on show me docs, which will take you to uh, the fast AI uh, documentation. So let me see if I can bring this up quickly on Jupyter. So see how that brings the documentation up for Antar data. And I can now click on show in docs. That will take me to uh, the fast AI documentation. It has plenty of examples on what it does. And I can click on the source here, which will take me to the source code of, uh, of, of basically any fast AI function. So you can use this for, for any fast AI function. I just wanted to quickly highlight that. Um, the last thing you would be surprised to know if you're new to deep learning is that uh, it's also possible to build models on tabular data. So if you're from a finance background, if you're from a medical background and you have like all these uh, tabular and you want to tell um, basically uh, as an example, this, uh, this example uses adults data set, uh, which tells if an adult is in a higher earning um, uh, if basically, if he's if he's earning high or less based on all these other factors like age, occupation, um, and that's just the tabular standard data, and you can actually now train models on tabular data as well. Uh, that's the most of it. Um, I did want to touch base on uh, validation and test sets as well. Um, so so far, I've I've told you uh, that validation and test set is uh, when you have your whole data set, then you just keep 20% of your data as separate. Uh, you train the model here and you validate the model here. Uh, 
Uh, but the thing is like, how do you split? Like, how do you find this 20% uh, data set? So if you have, this is where, I, uh, this is an, a key example to, to think about and to know. Uh, and this is again, something that's applicable to machine learning as well. Uh, if you have uh, a, an, a graph that looks like this, where you have data and sales, uh, then something that's really common practice is called like a random split. Uh, so what you do is you just take 20% of the data from, from anywhere uh, and you put it uh, in the validation set and it's called like a randomly picking up this data, but that's actually going to give you wrong results because when you're trying to predict sales, um, like it's going to give you, when, when you look at the accuracy or when you look at the metrics or the performance of the model, you're going to have the wrong performance expectation. Because um, when you take this model and you put it in a real world, um, then what you're gonna do, you, in, in a real world, you're going to try and predict sales for a, for a future date, right? When you, you have a trained model, you're gonna put it in production. Say you put it on production on the 1st of January, then what you really want to do is you want to make the prediction be done for the 2nd of January, for the 3rd of January. So what's really helpful, a, a better way of creating a validation set is that, you keep divided by timeline. So this is a much more, this is a much more real case scenario of uh, having a proper validation set of of twenty percent. Because if the model can actually perform good here, then you have a much more confidence that this model can actually work really well in a real world um, use case. Uh, lastly, this is the end of the chapter. Uh, this is where you choose your own adventure. Um, so this is where find projects that are of interest to you, whether it is Tableau, whether it is computer vision, uh, whether it is NLP, uh, but find things that are of interest to you and pick your own adventure. Because we want to be able to, you want to be able to go back and you want to be able to run each of these uh, lines of code and you want to be able to uh, basically understand from a high level here on uh, on what's happening. Um, and Sam has already shared the share your V2 projects uh, on forums.fastai. So if you go, oh, sorry, that is that what I started that um, back in March 20. Uh, anyway, uh, the idea is then uh, in on these forums, you'll see a lot of people will be sharing all in all of their, their, their ideas, their, their own projects. Um, so Radek has, has his own ideas and he's, he's, work, he's working on audio classification. Um, so if you are out of inspiration, then definitely go to this, this page or this forum post here and uh, pick your own uh, basically project that you want to work on. And lastly, every chapter comes, up, comes with a questionnaire. Uh, it's really, really important that you then everything that you've learned, you, you stop at the questionnaire and you go to the questionnaire and you go to these 33 questions. Um, and you need to be at a point where you're able to answer at least 25 of 33. Uh, but if you have to like reference back, that's okay, but it's just for your understanding that you're able to um, answer all these questions. So for example, what does weight assignment mean? I, I just picked this up randomly. Um, but this basically means that uh, a model has has weights, right? A model has weights associated with it. So this idea of, of a model having having weights is called as weight assignment. Um, so I need you to go back. I need you to reread -read this chapter. I need you to uh, run the code again and then see if you if all of these questions uh, make sense. Um, and with that being said, uh, we are ready for chapter two because uh, we also want to give time to uh, Tanishk to present his. Uh, to present some of his uh, work and his his journey, uh, so I will take five minutes of questions again. Oh, hey, Parul! I didn't realize you're attending. Uh, there's a, a blog series on on Facebook. Oh, yes. Um, I did say I would mention this. So this is again a wonderful resource. Thanks for sharing, Paro. Um, this blog series would have uh, basically each chapter as a blog in a simpler language. If you uh, want to refer to this, it's by Vajilim. He's also a fast AI uh, person, so you can go back and you can have a look at at these um, at these blogs. Okay. Uh, since the categories from pre-trained models are reduced to two, does that imply? 
Uh, no, that's an incorrect understanding. So I would recommend that you go back and have a look at. Sam's already answered most of them. Oh, uh, thanks, Sam. Is there any questions, Sam? I'm gonna make you uh, one second. Uh, let me make you panelist so then you can talk. Hey, Sam, is there any questions that you feel we should look at? You should be able to talk now. Sorry, you got promoted and I rejoined. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think any question is unanswered. Okay, excellent then. Uh, thanks for answering all the questions. Really appreciate your help. Sure thing. All right, um, so I'm sorry I took you by surprise and just made you a panelist right there. Um, but now, uh, as it's uh, we're towards the later end of the chapter, we're going to uh, we're going to spend now just 15 minutes on on chapter two production, which is going to help us uh, understand what's coming next, and then we will have Tanish present on uh, his journey of how he started with Fast AI and how he's come to where he he has today and. Um, then we'll also have an informal catch up on Slack uh, just to meet each other. All right, uh, with that being said, let's get started with, uh, with, with chapter two. Um, so chapter two is really, really interesting. Like chapter one gives you a highlight of everything that's going on in, in uh, deep learning world. Like it gives you an example of how you can use fast AI in just six lines of code uh, to train text classification models, how you can use fast AI to train image classification models. Um, but actually deep learning uh, and having worked in previous industries as well, uh, it's more than model training. When you actually wanna create a company out of an idea or you wanna put things in production, uh, production basically means when your customers can start using your, your product or not just customers, but basically users. So it's in a final stage where people can start using uh, your product. Uh, when you go from a from when you go from like having an idea to then going from this stage to actually being able to serve your model uh, so people can use it, it's actually more than just model training because you need things like you need data, you need infrastructure, uh, you need to have like really good uh, basically coding practices. You need to have tests. There's there's just a lot more that does happen um, than just model training. And so far in chapter one we've just seen model training. Um, so then the next thing is the practice of deep learning. Uh, so in this chapter, we're going to have practice on an end-to-end -end deep learning problem. Like how do we get the data set? How do we train the model? How do we serve it in production? Um, how do we uh, create a, a user interface uh, on the internet so then people can come and they can upload their own images and try? And uh, you know, we've we've seen in the first chapter is like six lines of code are something that can be used for uh, text images, uh, basically tabular. Uh, but deep learning isn't magic, uh, so those six lines of code won't work for every problem. Uh, but the mindset that you want to have is you want to have an open mind. Like you want to have an open mind, and you want to think, okay, maybe deep learning can solve this, and maybe I should try solving a problem. Uh, using this particular idea. And maybe I can convert my tabular data to, to images. Maybe I can convert my spectrograms to images. Um, and that's the mindset that you wanna have. You wanna have a really open mind. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Well, it's an experiment that, that's, uh, that you tried and you failed, but you learned out of it. Um, so starting your project, uh, as I've said, when you're in production, that's just uh, me drawing an image of you. Uh, so I'm really sorry if you don't look like this, but uh, you don't want to be spending, like if you have three months to work on a project, you don't want to be spending two and a half months uh, training a model. You actually want to be able to spend equal time in, like on each of these different parts of deep learning, like getting the data set, labeling a data set, then modeling, and then serving it in production. Um, you really wanna be able to spend equal time because then that will give you the skills and that will give you a really good exposure to all these other, other things. So the goal is not to find the perfect data set or project, but just to get started and iterate from there. So in your first iteration, you have something 
that's working. So that's your first iteration. It's okay if your model is really small, if the performance is 70% or I don't know, if the performance is not up to the mark, if your data set has errors, if the labeling, if the labels are uh, bad, uh, that's okay. Like if there's, there's some wrong labels in your data set, that's completely fine. What you want to do is you want to go in iteration. So in your first iteration, you want to do this. In your second iteration, you want to improve things. Then in your third impression, iteration, you want to still improve things. And by the time you're in your fourth iteration, you would have a pipeline that's working really beautifully. And a lot of Kaggle grandmasters, a lot of people on Kaggle and Singham would uh, definitely know more about this because he's interviewed, I don't know, uh, 50 or hundreds of them. Uh, and he works at H2O AI. Um, but a lot of Kaggle people have all these ways of like starting with the MVP version, and then you just iterate and iterate and iterate till you have something that, that's working. Um, so you, you, you complete lots of small experiments. Uh, and where do you start doing these experiments? Because from this week, you want to go back and you want to start training. Uh, you want to start training the model on your own data sets. Well, you start with the project that's related to you. You start with the project that's related to where you work. So you have access to data. So if you're a medical person, you start with x-rays and CT scans. If you're, a, if you're in a biology kind of a field, you work with uh, proteins, then you work with protein sequencing. Um, if you're a wildlife photographer, then you have like hundreds and thousands of wildlife images. Uh, that's where you start. Uh, if you're a music person, you start with uh, audio. Uh, if you're working with uh, lots of tabular side of things, I wouldn't, uh, on a side note, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't 100% recommend on starting with Tableau because uh, Tableau is still keeping up with um, text and images. So if you get stuck in a problem, you won't have five other people trying to answer it uh, for you. So it would be easier if you start with images and text, but you're more than welcome to start with Tableau. Like Tableau is now, uh, becoming a mature field uh, anyway. Um, but I would just say, um, take your pick and start with, with somewhere where, where you belong. Um, so it should be related to your field of interest. Uh, and the reason why it should be related to your field of interest is because if you're just doing it for the sake of it, you won't finish. So as I said, um, CV, text and, and Tableau uh, is where you can start uh, pretty much. Um, so the state of deep learning, because uh, this book was written in early 2020, uh, I'm going to actually skip this for now. And I just want to give spend five minutes on this section of the notebook first, which is gathering uh, data. Uh, so we will go back to look at what uh, deep learning can do today. Uh, but something I want to spend time on is as part of this uh, chapter, what you're actually going to be doing is you're going to be building a grizzly bear or a, basically a bear detector that can classify three types of bears, grizzly, black, and teddy bears. Um, and the first step, as I said, is, is getting the data set. Um, so the so there's like all these different uh, projects that you can do. And one of the really funny ones that Jeremy once mentioned in the fast AI course is that somebody built a deep learning model for his, for his fiance basically. Um, so she could classify the 16 cousins during a, a Christmas vacation. So she could get the camera out, take a picture, and then the model will tell you who that cousin is because she can remember the names, which is really, really interesting. And it's, it's um, you know, we've seen applications of, um, uh, basically, people are uh, trying to categorize their WhatsApp images into all these different uh, categories. So pick, take your pick that you feel you can do. And um, I just want to show you how you can get your data set, because this is something that's really going to help you. And it's really going to be important uh, this week is that you want to uh, we this uh, fast AI uh, uh, basically uh, uses something, a Bing image search. Uh, so if I go and I type Bing image search, and I type, say, I want to uh, do grizzly bear detector. So I type grizzly bears. Then these are the uh, a lot of images that I that I get uh, for, for grizzly bears. And if I want to make a grizzly bear versus teddy bear detector, then I can just search teddy bear, and that will give me all of these all of these te uh, teddy bears. Uh, so something that you will have to do is 
you will have to go to Microsoft Azure and you'll have to sign up. Uh, what that will do is that will give you an Azure search key. Um, it's okay if you get stuck uh, on forums.fast.ai. Uh, if you go, there's plenty of resources. Actually, it should be here. Um, so if I search Azure key, uh, then you will see like there's all these different Um, then you'll see all these different posts on uh, how you can get the image search key, basically. Um, so something you want to do then is you want to go to Microsoft Azure and you want to sign up. Uh, then you get the key, you put your key in like this. Uh, then there's this function called search images Bing. So you're more than welcome to call like doc search images Bing, which will bring up the documentation and the source code. Uh, and then when you say search images Bing, passing in your API key and you just say grizzly bear, uh, then what this is, this function is going to do. Um, if I said teddy bear, then all of these images are going to be downloaded using an API. So then you get your images um, and you pretty much have 150 images now of grizzly bear. So these images are just parts or URLs that look like this. Um, I can download them using the download URL uh, I can provide a destination that this is where I want to uh, basically download this image from the internet to this point. Uh, and then if I open the image, here you go, this is an image that's been <clears throat> downloaded from, from the internet. Uh, so what uh, this, this line of code does is that for each of these grizzly, bear, and teddy, uh, it, search, it searches grizzly bear, black bear, and teddy bear. And for each of these bear types, it will download the images. So by the time uh, when you get all your images, basically uh, get the parts of all the images that you've downloaded so far, this will return all those image parts. Uh, you can see how there's 406 images. So we, uh, just by doing like these 10 or 15 lines of code, we have 406 images of grizzly bears. Uh, and then something that you want to do is you just remove the corrupt images. So by corrupt images, I mean, these could be uh, black images or these could just be uh, having some corruption or some noise in them that you really don't want or in a teddy bear, it could be a picture of a football. Um, and then you just remove them and you finally have your data set ready. So that's the first step of your, uh, of your model training. Like you're now ready after this point, after running these 10, 15 lines of code is you're ready with your data set. So by now, if you wanna, if you're someone who uh, loves cricket, which I do as well, um, you can actually take the uh, cricket players off, uh, take the pictures of, of all the cricket players in a team that you support. Uh, if you're a football person or a footy person, then you, you could actually even use sport and you could try and classify them. Uh, so I want you to go back and I want you to uh, this week run these lines of code uh, and make sure that your data set is ready. And if you're feeling uh, enthusiastic, then keep going forward. And by the time you finish, you would have trained, um, you, you keep going forward and you keep following uh, these lines of code until you get to this point of, uh, until you get to this point here. So then by now you would have built an image classifier that can actually tell uh, that has really low accuracy and you can form a confusion matrix. We will touch upon what each of these things do, but it's actually the same code that we saw in, in first line, uh, sorry, the first chapter. You create your convolutional neural net and then you say fine tune four. Four just means you run four epochs of, of uh, training. Uh, so yeah, so uh, this is the homework for this week. Uh, we're going to stop here next week when we come back, we're going to look at where deep learning is in, uh, in all these other fields, what it can really do. Uh, but for this week, go back, read the first chapter, uh, run each and every line of code that was there in the first chapter. And then you run, um, you look at the questionnaire and you answer the questionnaire. Uh, and then you come to the second chapter and you make sure that, that your data set is ready. Like this is the bare, bare minimum that you have to do this week uh, if you want to follow along next week. Um, so thanks for that. I'll stop sharing my screen now. We are left with 15 minutes and that's um, Tanishk. Uh,
Hey, Tanish, you still here? Yep, I'm still here. Um, yeah, let me share my screen. Um, Okay, um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, I'll get started. Um, yeah, but before before I get started, I just wanted to also mention, I know that uh, Amin was talking about the, the questionnaires. Um, uh, I think I had posted some of the, you know, the solutions for some of the questionnaires, especially from, for, you know, the, the first, 12 or so chapters. So, you know, after you've completed it, if you want to hear another perspective, read another perspective, you can check that out. And it's also a wiki. So some of the other people on the forums have contributed to those uh, to those questionnaires. And so you can check that out as well after you've uh, completed them yourself. Um, hey, hey yeah. sorry, do you have a link for people to follow or these are the fast AI forums, right? Do you have a yeah, I think if you just oh, you search up fast AI, yeah, I can share them afterwards. But if you just search up fast AI questionnaire, they should come up. Uh, but yeah, I can share them afterwards um, in the Slack or somewhere. Um, yeah, so I'll just get started with my uh, presentation, and I'm um, I'm just talking about my machine learning and fast AI journey and providing a little bit of my advice as well. I know some of this is quite similar to what Jeremy has been mentioning as well, but I think it's also just helpful to see some examples of this in practice as well. Um, so yeah, just to get started, um, to talk about here, talk about my machine learning journey. Uh, I started becoming interested in machine learning back in 2015, 2016. And I actually started out by taking the uh, Coursera course um, on machine learning, which is, uh, also a quite well-known course. Um, and it you know talks about some of the basic concepts of machine learning. But even at that point, it was you know fairly outdated as, as a course. And you know, while it provided a, you know a basic understanding, there were some other concepts that it did not provide a thorough explanation of. Um, and then also, you know, I was I heard about this platform known as Kaggle. Um, and I had actually joined the platform back in 2016, a, a long time ago. Um, and I uh, just actually want to briefly talk about Kaggle because I think it's a, uh, an important platform for anyone who is interested in, in machine learning and data science. Uh, you know, Kaggle is a platform where it's basically, uh, you know, the platform to be where if you're interested in learning machine learning and, and data science. And they have various different um, uh, uh, the resources and also um, more importantly they have these competitions that they uh, that uh, they host and you know these are competitions where they have actual real world tasks and people from around the world are competing to uh, develop the best models for these tasks so these are some of the active competitions that are going on right now uh, there's one for COVID-19 detection there's one for alien signal detection there's uh, some uh, text classification uh, uh, problems as well so where's different uh, uh, tasks are available. Um, and of course, the all the previous competitions are available as well. So here's some examples of previous competitions. And you can also look for uh, competitions based on, you know, the type of data. And so this is a, just generally a great resource. Um, and also they have people upload their own data sets where you can uh, check out other data sets as well. And uh, people also share uh, code for these competitions and data sets. Uh, so for example, some uh, data analysis, some of starter uh, notebooks and pre-processing uh, code, all kinds of code is available to help you get up and running with some of these competitions. Um, and also discussion forums where they talk about uh, the competitions, different ideas, resources, etc. And there are also some uh, small, uh, some uh, short courses that they have on various topics as well, which uh, can be useful for supplementing your, uh, your journey. Uh, but to go back to uh, my, my journey on, on Kaggle, I started out uh, on Kaggle um, you know, just trying out some of these competitions, looking at the notebooks and the resources provided, and you know, trying to uh, uh, start out with these notebooks, make some changes, submit, and 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 work my way up. But unfortunately, it, it didn't start out uh, very successful. Um, some of these competitions, I did not perform as well. And you know, I, I, I guess after a certain point, I, I started, I, I, I kind of gave up on on Kaggle. Um, and this was back maybe four or five years ago. But then. After a while, I actually revisited Kaggle and was looking um, at some of the uh, competitions and I uh, kind of discovered the Fast AI library. Uh, and I noticed some of these notebooks were using the Fast AI library and performing quite well. I think some of the notebooks by uh, 
this person here, I, I, I Foss, I don't know how to say his uh, uh, username, but uh, he, some of his notebooks used uh, FastEI and they were quite um, helpful. And, and it seemed like uh, FastEI was uh, really helpful for people to get up and running and perform well in, in these competitions. And that got me really excited, especially when I saw there was a whole course behind this uh, library. And so I wanted to explore uh, this, uh, this course and get started. So, you know, I, I was able to take the course back in uh, beginning of 2019. Um, at that time, they had released a new iteration. So I, I, I started uh, diving into that new iteration of the course. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about what I did, what I did uh, when working through the course. And I want to um, bring up Jeremy's slide that he had mentioned earlier about how to do a fast AI lesson. Um, he talked about you know, watching the lecture, experimenting with the notebooks, uh, reproducing the notebooks, and also more importantly, repeating the, uh, uh, these experiments with different data sets. And this is what I really focused on uh, with my fast AI journey. And again, I was looking at resources like Kaggle to help me uh, be able to do, to do this. So uh, here are some examples of some of the notebooks that I had written up when I was uh, taking the fast AI course and exploring um, exploring some of these topics. So uh, my background is in biomedical engineering and I'm interested in medicine and biology and healthcare. So you can see some of these notebooks are, uh, you know, using, uh, are focused on tasks like blood cell classification, diabetic retinopathy diagnosis, um, ultrasound nerve segmentation. So I was looking at, you know, how to apply um, deep learning to some of these tasks, these image classification tasks or segmentation tasks. And I was also interested in a couple of the ongoing competitions. So there was one competition looking at earthquake prediction, and I tried out the FastAI tabular model when I was learning about, about that. Um, and apparently, uh, you know, I didn't submit this to the final competition, but apparently this would have gotten me about, uh, it would have gotten me within the top 5% of the competition, or you would get a silver medal for that competition. So I, I still uh, regret that I didn't submit this yet. <laughs> I didn't submit this to the competition, but I'm quite impressed that, you know, even with the basic concepts that we learn, this can take us quite far uh, uh, for real world tasks. Um, and then another aspect is, you know, what can you do after you train a model? Uh, you know, you want to share your knowledge uh, with, uh, with the world and also to uh, solidify that knowledge yourself. Uh, you know, uh, being able to communicate your, your work and prepare a project that others can, can see is an important aspect. So this was actually uh, some advice that was provided by a Kaggle Grandmaster, but I think it applies to any sort of machine learning project, not just Kaggle projects, but any sort of machine learning project. I think uh, this is a, a great way of, of sharing your work. Uh, you know, you can put it on a GitHub repository, uh, prepare a collab demo, uh, prepare a web, web application demo, writing a blog post. These are all great ways of, 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 sharing, of sharing your work. Um, and I just wanted to provide some examples of that. So, you know, I definitely was very interested in this diabetic retinopathy diagnosis problem. So I actually, um, you know, prepared a GitHub repository. I have some experiments here in my notebooks folder. Um, and, and there's some details in the readme about the different experiments. And uh, I have the models also uploaded. And, you know, the, the, I had uh, made a web app and that web app is available uh, through, it's a Heroku app. Um, and it's still available. You can check it out. Um, and, it, and, and you can see here, it's just a simple uh, application. I was able to find a template and I just, uh, you know, play around with the template. But it's just a great way of just, you know, sharing whatever you have uh, out with the world and, and having people uh, check it out. So, and I think it's just a really great educational experience. Sorry, um, just to add, just I want to, sorry to interrupt, but just to quickly add is um, as part of chapter two, we'll, we'll actually be building web apps. Um, so by the time you come back next week or throughout the week, if you want to read chapter two, you will be able to build a web app exactly like this that solves the problem you're interested in. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and then another project of mine, a more, a more recent project of mine has been focused on uh, this uh, uh, certain, uh, this particular type of task known as unpaired image to image translation. Um, and and uh, what I've been doing is I've been implementing this in fast AI and uh, and uh, preparing it as a as a uh, library for others to use. 
uh, and also training models, sharing those models. Um, and and this is this and also one thing I'd like to point out, um, and maybe we can discuss this later. But uh, it, it makes it um, the Fast AI also has a separate tool for you know developing libraries. And in fact, the Fast AI library is based on this tool known as MBDev, and it makes it really easy to uh, do things like this. And I think it's uh, that's another great tool uh, if you're in, interested in this sort of thing of maybe. Uh, de developing model implementations and sharing it with others or uh, whatever sort of machine learning project, uh, maybe this, this is a, a good approach to uh, for doing so. It makes it much easier where you can just have a series of notebooks with documentation as part of those notebooks and you put, you get a nice documentation website. Of course, you have your, your, uh, your library, uh, all part of this, uh, all due to this MBDF package. And of course, I have a simple um, a web demo also. Um, I know that, um, the, the fast AI book has its own, um, it talks about, I think, Wola, I think is the, the, the web app tool it uses. But, um, you know, I would, if, if you're interested, I would also investigate this tool known as Gradio because it, it and, I, and this, this tool actually makes it really simple to, to create web apps. It only takes a couple lines of code to actually uh, take an existing um, inference model uh, prediction function and, and make a web app from that. Mm -hmm. So that that's, that might be something you might be uh, interested in, in checking out as well. Okay, so I talked about how we can, um, uh, you know, take a project and, 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 you know, present it for the world to see and, uh, and you know, uh, how you can share your work. Um, I also just want to go back to, you know, the original story of how um, I started out with Fast AI, finding it on Kaggle and, and learning about it. And, you know, after, after I took the Fast AI course, uh, how it's, it's, it's tremendously helped my uh, experience on Kaggle and I've and I've also learned a lot from Kaggle as well um, and I've been able to participate in some of these competitions and um, you know uh, ob obtain positions in some of the uh, top top five percent or top three percent of the leaderboard so it, it's it's been a quite uh, interesting and educational experience and another aspect is I've been able to share uh, some, of, some of these tutorials starter notebooks um, and uh, data analysis on the Kaggle uh, as a Kaggle notebook, and I've been able to reach a Kaggle notebook master title. And also similarly, uh, I've been also able to reach discussion master title, you know, sharing different resources, asking questions, etc. cetera. Um, and there are also other FASTAI uh, Kagglers. I just wanted to highlight a few others who, uh, uh, you know, who, who have done a lot with uh, using FASTAI. Um, so of course, uh, Radic, I know we've heard a lot about him and, you know, he's, He's also an uh, experienced uh, Kaggle uh, master. Uh, and then I Foss is also another Kaggle master. Uh, both of them share amazing uh, notebooks and, and, and starter material uh, using Fast AI. Uh, this is another uh, Kaggle master who has uh, performed well with uh, the Fast AI library. Uh, also another Kaggle master uh, who has actually won a, a competition with uh, Fast AI. So um, all quite uh, impressive feats by uh, other fast ai alumni yeah um, and, and then dr habib I, um oh, yeah. is is really uh you know he helped me with blog posts as well so dr habib i know well i know all of them are really open to answering questions and um dr habib has then also contributed to blogs and he's also helped with the vision transformer blogs that we've written um so i just wanted to really point that out as well that on top of kaggle um it's these guys really are um, who we look up to when we first started. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's just a very sharing and it's a very uh, giving uh, nature that they have. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And then of course I was, I think we've already discussed this a couple of times today, but it's also it's important to, uh, you know, uh, share your work with the community uh, and, 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 you know, people will, uh, it's uh, people will love to hear what you you've been working on and uh, and of course this is this is the post that you should be uh, sh sharing it on the fast AI forums. So I often share whatever you know Kaggle notebooks or projects or whatever I, I share it on this and um, others have been doing so as well. And you know of course it's you know important to contribute back to the community. I know that Amin has been doing this whole uh, fast book reading session as a way to contribute to the community. Um, I've been contributing by, uh, you know, asking and answering questions on the forums. Both are e equally as important, both asking and answering, um, and, um, and and that has made me a top contributor on on the FASTA forums. And then also I've been uh, uh, 
uh, adding you know, features or fixing bugs for the FastAI library as well. Um, and that's one thing I also want to point out um, about you know, contributing to the library. Um, you know, it, if you have any, you know, when you're using the FASA library, if there's something that you find is, is insufficient with the library or this may be some problem you have, I think it, you know, it's, it's great if you can uh, c contribute uh, back to the library and, you know, add that feature or fix that bug. And some of them can be, you know, simple bugs. Like for example, one time I found uh, it, there was some problem with the extension. It didn't support one of the extension. I just uh, made a quick fix it and, and submitted it. And, you know, that's definitely greatly appreciated by the, the entire community. Uh, other times, you know, I had found out there's this training technique that, you know, that wasn't supported in FASTA. I, I decided to add it to the library. Um, and I would say that also, contributing to the library is just a great experience for learning how to uh, use uh, developer tools and developer workflows like Git and GitHub. And, um, you know, these are the tools that um, all software engineers really use uh, in, in for uh, practical applications. So I think if, you, if, if that's something you want to learn, this is a great way of, of doing that as well. Um, and then just to briefly talk about how FastAI has helped me with my uh, with my own research. So I'm a PhD uh, candidate uh, at UC Davis uh, in biomedical engineering. And uh, I've been using FastAI for my own research, uh, applying deep learning to microscopy. I've presented at the ICML Computational Biology Workshop and hopefully will be submitting a paper also uh, sometime this year focused on this research. Um, I'd be glad to talk about that uh, uh, later on as well. And of wow. course, uh, yeah, a uh, couple more slides. Um, it's important to stay up to date with the with the field um, of machine learning, and these are some of the resources. Of course, as we talked about, Twitter is, is a great resource, um, and there are other resources like the the machine learning stuff, Reddit, uh, the FastAI Discord, uh, and there's some other Discord servers and some other websites as well. And of course, important to keep in mind that the journey never ends. Um, I think this is especially true for deep learning as a field uh, that is, uh, you know, rapidly moving. Um, you know, I've also, you know, taken the FASA course a couple of times, and I've learned something uh, each of each of the times that I've taken it, and of course from all the resources online. Um, and I'm always, uh, you know, reading new papers and always learning. So uh, I think this is especially an important uh, aspect of of your deep learning journey. Um, with that said, uh, you know, uh, feel free to me out on any of these uh, social media or other channels and um, that's the end of the presentation um, thank you Tony it's really uh, you know even for me it's even though I know you for, for quite some time now it's even for me it's really exciting to see your journey and still gives me the chills and how much uh, it is able like people are able to achieve if you stick to a problem and you you've had your interest in biomedical and you've, you've stuck to biomedical and it's really important to also realize that that's why it's important to find things that you you really love and you that really interest you because otherwise it will be really hard for people to finish and they'll give up when when there's a roadblock um here's a fun fact just for people in case i i, I forgot to mention um tanishi is 18 year old so uh when he says he started in back in 20 i don't know it's 15 16 we were probably 13 14 or um yeah. yeah, so that's just a that's just a fun factor for everybody. Uh, with that being said, this would be the end of uh, the session today, but we are going to uh, meet in Slack and we are going to meet for uh, the informal catch up where everybody can have their uh, audio and video on and we talk to each other and we just get to know you guys as well and your expectations um, from the course and Tanish, you're going to be around there for a, for a little bit. Um, so yes, yes. Can ask you questions. Excellent. All right. Um, See you guys in Slack. I'll post a link over there for, for Zoom and we can we'll all meet you there. Um thanks for today and see you guys next week. Thanks, Tanish. Okay, time. See you.